You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. So many subjects, so many guests, I'll have to truncate my monologue for you this evening because we have to squeeze it all into two hours. The February 25 no to war, no to NATO rally in central London goes ahead this time with an unshakable venue having been badly let down, unlawfully let down by two previous landlords. But it's going ahead with some of the best speakers anywhere in the world. Members of the European Parliament, former British ambassadors, former members of the British Parliament, royalty of the democracy movement in the United States of America, and low-key, the great and popular entertainer, Andy Hudd, the trade union leader from the Train Drivers Union, Aslef, and many more. It starts at 11 a.m. in central London. You'll be told exactly where on the evening before, most likely, and by social media, so stay tuned. But it's in central London. There's a queue for you. Now, leaving aside the thugs of the NATO support base, the misogynistic, evil, wicked, and utterly berserk thugs of the NATO support movement that most people with any sense have now blocked, leaving aside the other stories which I could have covered at length this evening, like the popular Mail on Sunday journalist Peter Hitchens being secretly surveyed by the British Army, I'm not making that up, like the Right Honourable David Davis, a Privy Councillor, a councillor to Her Majesty the Queen, who was being secretly spied upon and surveyed by the Queen's Army in the run-up to and including the COVID emergency through which we passed before the Ukraine emergency, leaving aside the sacking of someone called Zahawi or Rashid Sawawi or something like that, being sacked for a gross breach of integrity by Rishi Sunak. So it must have been very gross indeed. He's the man who charged the taxpayer for heating the stables that his racehorses lived in. I'm not making that up either. He charged tens of thousands of pounds to the British taxpayer on parliamentary expenses in order to heat his racehorses. I've no idea how such a man ever became a member of parliament. I knew him when he was a grubby oil trader in Iraq. I've no idea how such a man became a minister, became a cabinet minister, and had to be sacked for a gross breach of integrity. Integrity and Zahawi are words that don't belong in the same sentence, and it is a telling testament to the shrunken British political class that such a man could rise so far only to fall. But like a rat being kicked off a sinking ship, his abandonment of the fray will not change the eventual outcome. Rishi Sunak is dead meat. He is politically a dead parrot. Nothing he does or says, and he doesn't do or say much, can alter the course of British politics. There's so much I could say about that, but the international situation has become so grave, it is impossible to avoid it. If I take China, for example, the new head of the Congressional Foreign Affairs Committee today agreed with the five-star American general who said that America will be at war with China within two years. He went on to teach his soldiers that they should aim for the head, which any fool knoweth is the wrong instruction to give any soldier other than a sniper. You're supposed to aim for the main body mass. I was a soldier, as Ben Wallace is going to find out in my debate with him, in the Oxford Union shortly. You aim 
for the broad body mass. But this general thinks you can shoot your way through the heads of the Chinese and prevail. This was no ordinary soldier. He was talking to 110,000 members of the serving and reserve armed forces of the United States of America. And he was extraordinarily precise. We're going to be at war with China, not in two and a half years, three and a half or five, or maybe at some time in the near future, but within two years. It has the benefit, of course, of making China fully aware of what is in store and what all these maneuvers are paving stones towards. It makes China know all the more keenly that Russia must prevail against NATO in the Ukraine. And I'm not sure the general fully thought that through. You can look forward to intense, increased coordination and collaboration between China and Russia as both countries now know from the horse's mouth that the destruction of both of them is the American policy goal and not in the distant future, but in the case of the next two years. This was bad enough. Following on from the decision of the German government, I was going to call them the Gauleiters of Joe Biden in Germany, finally succumbed to the hullabaloo and agreed to supply their panzers to cross the Ukrainian border to fight Russians again. As the Croatian president put it, well, good luck on that. They might have better luck than the German panzers which crossed all those decades ago in Operation Barbarossa. Or they might not, as he put it. They might fare better than the American Abrams tanks did in Iraq, in Syria. Or they may not. They are in any case being delivered in such paucity as to be merely theater, but theater works both ways. Companies in Russia are offering tens of millions of rubles reward for whomsoever can destroy a German Panzer or an American Abrams tank. And I myself, looking at it entirely dispassionately, don't think that these tanks will last five minutes if they ever appear on the battlefield. But the tanks are merely the latest opening baguette. The Ukrainian government no sooner received the offer of the tanks as it demanded F-16 fighter jets, long-range artillery that can strike deep into the heart of Russia and German naval submarines. There's no end to the voracious appetite of the Zelensky regime, Ukraine is a very demanding mistress, as Western countries are rapidly finding out. But all of this, just like the warning to China, concentrates the Russian mind wonderfully. They know that the madness of crowds may well have set in in the West and that no one can guarantee that no piece of military hardware or no military intervention from NATO can entirely be ruled out, and therefore this war must be ended pretty damn quick. And that's what I predict is already happening. The city of Bakhmut, according to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, has turned to situation grave. And grave is the operative word for thousands of poor young Ukrainian service personnel have already given their life's blood there. For a place that the Ukrainians first described as strategically vital, then when it looked likely to fall as strategically meaningless, but is nonetheless being defended to the last drop of the blood of the last 
Ukrainian defender nonetheless. Bakhmut opens the road to the landlocking of Ukraine. Now I have been saying for many months a vital war aim of the Russian Federation. That way there'll never be any German submarines. That way it will no longer be anybody else's lake but Russia's. That way Western Ukraine or what is left of it after the Poles and the Hungarians have taken their pick and the Romanians and the Moldovans have taken their pick will be the rump Kosovo type NATO protectorate that I have predicted all along. But last night, perhaps an even more dangerous theater of operations opened up. An earthquake hit the Iranian city of Khoi. It has injured hundreds, if not thousands of people. It has killed several people. There is no sign yet of the cause of this 5.5 on the Richter scale earthquake, but many are speculating, I'm not making this up, that a nuclear device was exploded in order to create that earthquake. No doubt investigations by the highest international authorities will now be ordered by the United Nations Security Council. No, I'm only kidding. No doubt the bombardment of vital Iranian military installations which took place at exactly the same time, the same hour in Isfahan will be responded to with examination, investigation and sanctions against the perpetrators. No, I'm only kidding about that also. According to the Wall Street Journal, and in the last hour of the New York Times, Israel carried out these bombing raids against the Islamic Republic of Iran overnight. U.S. State Department officials confirm to Wall Street Journal and New York Times journalists. Now, I'd be the last man to say that means it's true, but it is looking increasingly likely that Iran was attacked by Israel last night. Now, Iran did its best in the wee hours of the morning to downplay the events, to state that they were indeed entirely coincidental. Iran did their best to downplay the scale of the attack because, of course, the bigger the attack, the more Iran will be forced to answer it. Of course, the clearer the perpetrator is, the more clear Iran will be against whom it must react. In the past, Iran has reacted through its allies in Yemen, in Iraq, in Lebanon. But a scale that is now looming into view of this attack last night surely means that Iran will have to do the reacting itself for its own credibility, for its own security now and into the future. And thus the possibility is now with us this evening of war raging throughout the world, in the Persian Gulf, in Europe, and in the South China Sea, in the Straits of Taiwan, in the Pacific. If that's not World War III, I'm not sure how you would define World War III. War throughout the world. War on three fronts. Against Iran, against Russia, and against China. A premature ejaculation of confrontation, presumably driven by the fact that Russia, China, and Iran are only going to get stronger and stronger whilst those who have launched these wars against them are already visibly getting weaker and weaker. There'll be more, much more from me in the course of the show on this and other issues. But for now, I want to clear the decks because coming up is the one and only incomparable Jimmy Dore.
Stay tuned. Seven hundred and seventy-four thousand people watched all or part of last Sunday's Mother of All talk shows. With our first guest this evening, that number is definitely going to be exceeded. But first, we've got a poll running on my Twitter, on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. I'm at two hundred and forty-one thousand subscribers now. I'm determined to get a quarter of Jimmy Dore's number before the end of the year. And if you like, you can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, or on the YouTube community poll. 7,591 people have already voted on the question, will we be at war with China in two years? A, yes, B, no. So get voting before the end of the show. If you want to comment on anything I've said or haven't said but should have, here are the numbers. If you're in the UK and Ireland, it's 0808196552. That's 0808196552. It's entirely free of charge. If you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And that too is toll free. If you're in the perhaps mythical rest of the world, it's 442039662625. That's plus 442039662625. The go to man for anyone with any sense in the United States of America to try and make sense of what's going on in that crazy country and what that crazy country is doing around the world. Is the one and only Jimmy Dore who joins us now, host of the legendary Jimmy Dore Show. Jimmy, let's start with a very somber matter uh, indeed. The whole world has now seen the horrific uh, um, body cam footage uh, of the savage clubbing to death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the police... Uh, not just killing him, but leaving him there to die slowly. The uh, other uh, services that turned up after the fact, standing around, laughing, joking, smoking, and so on. It's possibly the worst movie out of America that wasn't made uh, by uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, it's, you know, policing, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but certainly in America, it's broken, and it's been broken for a long time, and they fill our our policing with ex-military people, too, which is another bad thing. And um, uh, there's lots of ways to reform the police in the United States, but the oligarchy doesn't want it. So let's remember what the police are there. They're not really there to keep you safe. They're there to protect the property of the oligarchies. And um, so they, even though these policemen were all African-American, uh, they're still saying that this was, you know, because of systemic racism inside the policing in America. I just think of, I think police in America are just uh, they recruit the wrong people. They're out of control maniacs. They're hopped up on steroids. Uh, they don't live in the neighborhoods that they police in. So they don't they don't see the citizenry in America as someone that they're supposed to serve. They see them as, they see them as the enemy. And so, like, for instance, in Los Angeles, all, all the cops live uh, 30 miles outside of the city and then they drive into the city to police us like the like not uh, like they're animals. So that's what happens. And uh, there's really uh, so we did a whole year of protests in the United States. Uh, it was the biggest protest in the history of our country. And what the Democrats did after that year of protests was they invented another police um department and they funded it with two billion dollars and then they uh they gave many many more millions of dollars to the police it was the exact opposite of what their voters wanted them to do so again we live in an oligarchy that's why there will be no police reform because the police serve the oligarchs it's the same problem with everything it's why we don't have health care in america the richest country in the world it's why the richest country in the world half of the people here are poor or low income it's 80 percent of workers live paycheck to paycheck in the richest country in the world because people don't realize that the united states the people in america think the united states is just regular corrupt 
They don't understand that it's 100 percent corrupt, which is why we can send 100 billion dollars to Nazis in Ukraine right in our faces when we won't send 100 billion dollars to the United States so that we can fix homelessness or give people health care or a living way. And the people see that this is happening now, slowly starting to see whether they will get uh, uh, joined together and rise up. They need a leader to bring people together. And what's starting to happen in America is people on the left and the right are starting to see that they share a common interest. And that's what actually scares the oligarchy the most. And so if that happens, then maybe we can have some reform of the police. If that happens, maybe we can have health care in America. If that happens, maybe we can end these murderous wars for fossil fuels and, hege and hegemony. And maybe we can start investing in our own country. We don't have, you know, we were supposed to get high speed trains here during the first economic collapse in 2008. They were supposed to have high speed trains all over America. They never built one. We don't have anything in the United States that other countries have. We don't have health care. We don't have transportation. We don't have living wage. We have education system that bankrupts you. And it's because our co our country is completely 100 percent bought by corporations. Right. So we're living in a fascist state. And the trick they play is the Democrats and the Democrat well, liberal me corporate owned media. They try to trick you into thinking one party is fascist and one party isn't. So it keeps you inside that system thinking someone's actually fighting for you. There is nobody fighting for you inside the government of the United States. And that's what the just got revealed when the lefty uh, squad completely rolled over and became war pigs. So if you're a lefty, you're supposed to at least be against war. They're the biggest war pigs in the world, and they'll never stand up against the establishment to stick up for the people who got them there. So I know that's a long answer, and I know it started with what's wrong with policing in America. But what's wrong with policing in America is a symptom of what's wrong with America. America, is that we live in a 100% completely corrupt country where the gears of the government only work if it's lubricated with corruption, which is why we can send $100 billion at the snap of a finger to the most corrupt country in Europe while we won't send $100 billion to fix homelessness in America. Well, they do need a leader, and that leader needs to have a hat, uh, Jimmy, but I'll not press you on that point uh, this time at least. The uh, The... Characteristics of fascism are many, but of course, one of them is uh, that you have a rubber sta stamp parliament with one party in it. And that was proved all over again this week, wasn't it? The Republicans had run on uh, a, a ticket that criticized this huge largesse being given to the most corrupt country in Europe. But when it came to, when push came to shove, uh, they have now agreed to send the very same money. So we have absolute bipartisanship in, uh, in, in, in stuffing the mouths of the oligarchs in Ukraine as long as they kick enough of it back to the United States through the military-industrial complex and the politicians themselves. Am I right? Of course, you're 100 percent right. And that's why people hate me from both parties in America. I get a lot of vitriol, especially from the Democrats, because I keep pointing out that the Democrats aren't different than the Republicans, that on all the major issues, they serve the same people. Ralph Nader famously said the only difference between a Democrat and Republican is the speed at which their knee hits the ground when a donor walks in the room. And so the way we do politics in America is we only have two parties that are viable and they're both bought and paid for by the same people. So it's just, I don't know if you know, if you ever heard of the Harlem Globetrotters, but they're a, a basketball team in the United yeah. States and they play every game yeah. against the Washington Generals and they always beat them. And it's because they're being paid by the same guy. It's a show. And that's what's happening in the United States. And when I tell people that the Democrats aren't a lesser or two of evil, they say I'm enabling fascists. Joe Biden and the Democrats are bigger fascists than Trump ever even tried to be. They just crashed. They just crushed a railroad strike. So railroad workers don't get sick leave in the United States. Railroad workers, the glue that holds our economy together, they won't even give those people sick pay. That's how corrupted our whole culture and system is over here. And so they were going to go on strike and they would have got it. They would have got it like that. 
Joe Biden and the Democrats, after just running an election saying you have to vote for us because we're the ones who are going to protect democracy and the Republicans are fascists, they immediately committed fascism and instituted a strike break. They broke that strike, passed the law that they had to accept the contract or there was illegal. So that's what the Democrats are. They're actually in bed with big business to crush workers. That's the definition of fascism. I don't want to be around the bush. Joe Biden and the Democrats are fascist. We live in a fascist country. Country. And the idea that Joe Biden and the Democrats are fighting fasc fascism is a narrative the Democrat and the corporate media wants you to believe. They are fascists and the Democrats are not a lesser of two evil. They are a greater of two evils. They, If Trump right now was saber rattling and trying to start a nuclear, starting wars with two nuclear powers, which is what Joe Biden's doing, people would be screaming bloody murder with their hair on fire. But because the corporate news media owned by the military industrial complex says it's okay and Joe Biden's supposed to not be crazy like Trump then everybody nobody can they, they they literally get people to go along with the Ukraine war as if Putin is some kind of a madman and we're not we know we're occupying a third of Syria right now and why are we occupying it for the oil who said that the president of the United States admitted that our foreign policy is based on stealing other countries fossil fuels which is what we're doing right now and somehow in America everybody just thinks Putin's bad Bad, and Ukraine's bad. They have no idea that America, the United States government and their military are the world's terrorists. Now, uh, there is one man uh, who is uh, beginning to stand out as a difference. And it's the man that you just mentioned. Uh, the man that we were told was so crazy, he might start the Third World War. And therefore, we better elect our grandpa, uh, Joe Biden, in order to avert it. Uh, he said this week, uh, first it's the tanks, then it's the nukes. He said this week that we are heading inexorably. He didn't use that word. He doesn't use big words. He said we were heading into a disaster. Uh, are his supporters listening to him? If so, that's at least 70 million people we've got on our side in the anti-war cause, isn't it? I would, uh, you know, that's a... That would be nice if that was true, but of course it's not, right? So most Republicans are on board, uh, just like most Democrats are on board for war, and they always will be. So the weird thing is, is that there used to be token opposition to war in the United States from the left, from the far left. There is no far left in America anymore. They're not. They're, the Democratic Party is a right-wing party, as is the, as the Republican Party. The odd thing is the only people that actually try to do something and stand up against war has been the far right wing. So we, so it used to be the far right wing and the far left wing would oppose war and imperialism, but now it's just the far right wing. And uh, I, Donald Trump was way less of a warmonger than Joe Biden and Barack Obama, that's for sure. Uh, and George Bush. And let's remember that Barack Obama was not a departure from George Bush. He was a continuation of that same policy. And why was he allowed to become president? Because he serves that same oligarchy and corporatocracy. His entire cabinet, Barack Obama's entire cabinet, WikiLeaks revealed, was chosen by Citibank already. So they, so that's the, and so when Barack Obama became president, he didn't end those wars. And it, he took us from two wars to seven. He dropped more bombs than George Bush. He built, he deployed, deported more Hispanics than uh, twice as many as Donald Trump. He built the cages that they were putting immigrants in. So Barack Obama was a, he kicked 5.1 million families out of their homes while he made sure the bankers got their bonuses. So this idea that the Democrats and Republicans are different, they're not. They actually serve the exact same people, which is why we're living in the country we live in right now. And I don't have any hope for it getting better unless people get in the streets. What is starting to happen is Amazon. There's a man named Christian Smalls who organized Amazon workers at a fulfillment center in New York City in a borough called Staten Island. Now, Staten Island is mostly white and the people there are uh, Trump voters. And so there was a black guy who came along, organized Trump voters in a union against Amazon. And so when people say we have to organize along class lines, 
That's what it means. It means organizing with Trump voters. But Democrats will never do that because the people who own them want to keep us divided and keep pretending that my enemy is my neighbor in America. My neighbor is not my enemy. My enemy is the oligarchs that control both parties, but they want me to hate my neighbor because of the economic pain we're feeling because the oligarchy did a controlled demolition of our economy during COVID, which we all know now came with zero science. And they want me to be angry at my neighbor because of the pain I'm feeling because my neighbor wouldn't take a vaccine that never worked the way they said it did in the first place. Well, I'm not going to hate my neighbor. I'm going to join with my neighbor, just like Christian Smalls did in, with Amazon. And I'm going to join against the oligarchy. And that's the only way to beat these guys. Now, uh, the congressional head of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the new guy, a Republican, uh, has endorsed the view of the American general who said this week that within two years, the U.S. will be at war with China. Did that cause any waves in the U.S.? Or, or do, are people just going quietly into these good nights? People are going quietly. <laughs> it didn't race. No, no one. It's only a story if the corporate news decides it's a story. So the corporate news decided it wasn't a story. And that's it. We only have six media companies in America. That's another reason why the Democrats are not the lesser of two evil. When I was young, we used to have 50 giant media companies in America, right? That That's still consolidated. But 50, we had 50 giant media companies. When Bill Clinton became president in 1996, he got rid of all the regulations. And so now they've consolidated the media power. There's only six media companies in the entire country. And so if you want to be a journalist, you have to work for one of the six oligarch corporations and they control everything as Chomsky taught us with their five filters of propaganda. The first one is ownership. So th there's nowhere to get that information that that general said, or if you get that information, there's nobody to put it in context. The person who they have on the corporate news in America to tell you what that, ge what that general meant when he said that, they'll bring on a guy from a weapons manufacturing company, somebody from Raytheon or Boeing. They'll bring on an ex-general who's working to sell more weapons to try to tell you what that guy said. That means it's good. We have to go to war with China. We have to do this. We're, and they always say it's because we're defending democracy. What they're defending is their American hegemony, imperialism, and these are all wars for economic and fossil fuels. What's happening right now in Europe? We uh, Russia was supplying, what, 30, 40% of the energy to Europe. We, are, we Americans wanted some of that. And so now America, all of a sudden, is selling more liquid natrified, uh, natural uh, liquefied natural gas to Europe as they blow up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So I don't know. Uh, it, 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 they do it right out in the open, as Chris Hedges says. Now, they just lie, cheat and steal right out in the open and nobody does anything. Can people not? And it's weird to me that the people in Europe are putting up with this or Ukraine thing as if anybody gives a shit about the people in Ukraine because they don't. What they want, what they want to do is get those people slaughtered in a proxy war for American hegemony. And you're a moron if you think that the United States is sending $100 billion in arms to a country because we care about the people. Look how much we cared about the Iraq people. Look how much we cared about the Libyan people. Look how much we cared about the Syrian people. Look how much we care about the Yemen people. Look how much we care about the Somalian people. We don't care about, and look about Afghanistan. 20 years we tortured those people. We didn't even know who the bad guys or the good guys were over there as the Afghanistan papers revealed. We're the criminals, the United States are the terrorists, and Europe, for going along with them, are cowards. Yeah, uh, cowards and fools. Uh, lastly, and it's not something we expected to be talking about tonight, because it is literally becoming more clear uh, by the minute. Uh, but it seems clear enough, certainly for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to uh, deliver an ex-cathedra verdict on it that the attacks on Iran last night were mounted by Israel, which means, of course, they were paid for by the United States. The armaments that were used were uh, likely supplied by the United States. Uh, if true, would this be Israel acting on its own, of its own volition, or is this a deliberate move to open yet another war front by the U.S. administration? So, yes, the United States has wanted to uh, 
to overthrow the government and ran for a while. And that's why if you in the corporate media, so whenever the United States wants to go do a coup and overthrow a government, what you see in the corporate media in the United States is how oppressed their people are. So that's what we've been seeing right away is that uh, the Iranians, the Iranian women want to want freedom and they want to take off their headscarves and all that stuff and they want freedom. And so we're supposed to all be, and so we're being flooded with these stories of courageous women standing up against the regime in Iran. And when, as soon as you see that, of course, all the morons in America, they believe it, they take it at face value that, now oh, we gotta go help these people. But of course they do that because the United States as an economic hegemon wants to do that. They wanna do it to help Israel. They wanna do it for their own good. Uh, we're Again, the United States is the word. So Wesley uh, Clark, General Wesley Clark famously said on a show called Democracy, now about after 9-11 he went to the pentagon he was a general went to the pentagon and he was told he was shown papers that before 9-11 they had already drawn up plans to invade all the countries that they've been invading iraq iran syria libya sudan we're betting all those goddamn countries afghanistan so this was this has nothing to do with what they tell you about and so yes uh, again, the United States, Israel, they're, they're the, the the irony is Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States are the world's biggest terrorists, have been for the last 40 years, and ain't nothing going to change that. Jimmy Dore, a pleasure as always to talk with you. Host of the Jimmy Dore Show, comedian, raconteur, political analyst, razor sharp, and one day, I hope, the next president of the United States. Will we be at war with China in two years? Yes or no? The poll is raging. 10,000 people nearly have voted. 41% say yes on Twitter. 59% say no. On YouTube, 43% say yes. 57% say no. On Telegram, 52% say yes. And 48% say no, always the most perspicacious of our pollsters. And on the YouTube community poll, it's yes, 45, no, 55. Let's take a call from New Jersey, from Joe, on the subject of police brutality. Joe, what would you like to say? Hey, George. Hey, uh, power to the people. And God bless Julian Assange. And uh, hey, man, Jimmy Dore was at the top of his game tonight. He's Jimmy some D man. He's yeah. some man, yeah. Hey, hey, I'd like to talk about the terrorist attack in Memphis that we all witnessed. You know, these are state-sponsored terrorists, George. They are praised, they are rewarded, they are funded, encouraged by the coup government to instill fear, terror, and horror into the American people, to fear authority, to fear this coup government. These, these uh, police, these state-sponsored terrorists, have killed more Americans on the soil of the United States of America than any other terrorist organization, any other state, or any other government in the history of the United States of America. They pose a greater threat to we the people on our soil than Osama bin Laden and ISIS ever did. A greater threat to we the people on our soil than Adolf Hitler ever did. And nobody in the history of our America has posed a greater or more imminent threat to our freedom, our liberty, our democracy on our soil than these state-sponsored police. They're commonly known as Blue ISIS in America. They're commonly called the, new, the Blue Nazi Group here in America, which is an illustration of what they really represent. And uh, they have killed more Americans on our soil per year than assault weapons kill in the United States of America. They killed more Americans than the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, easily verifiable fact. They have killed more Americans than Saddam Hussein's army. They have killed more Americans than the 911 terrorists. And uh, we can see what the Palestinian people face on a regular basis because our police have been brought into our America by the coup government to train our police to use the same brutal methods and these same brutal tactics against our minorities that the IDF uses against the Palestinian people. And, um, you know, our police have killed 32,542 Americans on our soil uh, since between the years of 2000 and 2022. The, the North Koreans have killed or the Koreans killed 36,516 Americans. The, the Vietnamese killed 58,000 Americans while our state-sponsored terrorists, the police, 
have killed 32,542 Americans. As our government spends over $800 billion a year telling the American people that they plan, they use this money, our money, to keep us safe, but yet they fund these state-sponsored terrorists. They fund these, these, uh, these police to, to mass murder the American people. They pose a greater threat on a regular basis to the American people than the school shooters or the mass shooters in, in America. You know, so uh, so that's my comment, George. And uh, again, best wishes to Jimmy. Well, George. it's very, very powerful. Yeah, it's very, very powerful, uh, Joe. Food for thought. I've got some thoughts uh, on it, which I, I hope to get time to adumbrate later uh, in the course of the show. But you've really got me thinking. I had no idea of the scale, the comparative scale, but. There it is. Joe in New Jersey on the mother of all talk shows says the American police have killed more Americans than any other terrorist group or foreign state foe in the last century uh, or so. It's a chilling claim. We'll investigate it in uh, due course. Now, uh, what uh, will become known as the Munich tape uh, was something uh, me and my good wife, Gayatri, just uh, put together ourselves, literally on the streets, uh, at a street cafe, uh, because we were so outraged at the decision made to exclude Russia, the liberators of Auschwitz, from the 78th anniversary commemoration of the death camps liberation. The insult that was added to this injury was that Ukraine, governed by people who worship the guy who killed alongside the Nazis an almost uncountable number of Jews and Poles and Russians and Ukrainians and other minorities living within what is now Ukraine in the Eastern Holocaust, the Holocaust of the East, that they were to be there commemorating the liberation of Auschwitz, whilst the country that freed the benighted souls who survived the death camp behind the barbed wire of Auschwitz were to be excluded as not being fit and proper people to be in such polite company. Here's the Munich tape. Tell me what you think of it. In the Wednesday show, I spoke at length about the decision of the German government, Social Democrats and Greens in coalition, can you believe it, to fuel the war in Ukraine by sending their panzers. What could possibly go wrong? German tanks crossing the Ukrainian frontier to fight Russians. If you're interested in my take on that, you can look back at Wednesday's show. Today I want to talk about the extraordinary decision to ban Russia from the anniversary commemorations of the liberation of the death camp at Auschwitz. Built by Germans, but manned by Poles. The German and Polish governments will be there, as will the Ukrainian government, which is, of course, entirely enthralled to the people that carried out the Holocaust in the East, the people who massacred millions of Jews and non-Jewish Poles and Russians and others. Millions of them were killed by the supporters of Bandera, who is the national icon of today's government in Ukraine. So the people who liberated the death camp are banned from the event. The people who built, manned, and took joy in the genocide that took place in the death camp are all honored guests. If that does not sum up to you the deep and profound sickness in European, indeed world politics today, I don't know what would do. If it wasn't for the Russians, I'd be speaking to you in German, if it wasn't for the Russians, Europe at least, and most of the world in fact, would still be under the jackboot of fascism. Italian fascism, Japanese fascism, German fascism. Hitler began his long march, of course, in Munich 
but they are marching still. Lest anybody imagine for a minute that I hate Germans, nothing could be further from the truth. Some of the best friends I've ever had have been German. And the good people of Munich were out on the streets protesting against Olaf Schulz's decision to join the war. Indeed, his foreign minister announced that Germany was at war with Russia, which is such a legal minefield. I'm amazed she has not been slapped down by Schultz so far because, of course, that would mean that Russia was fully legally entitled to take self-defensive measures against Germany right now. Maybe they will. Maybe Russia will have to liberate Auschwitz again. Maybe Russia will have to liberate Europe again because we are now living in a new kind of fascism where people with different points of view are not put into camps, but they are effectively banished, exiled from their own countries. They are exiled from the platforms that they had been using. They are forbidden to be on television or radio or space in the newspapers. This is, after all, how fascism began. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that the death camps are on their way. Perhaps they have no need of death camps, but if they did ever fully go back down that road again, who would you trust to save us from them? Me, I'd save the Russian people who gave 27 million dead in the defeat of Nazism in 1945, in the ruins of Berlin, around the very same Reichstag that the foreign minister declared war on Russia this very week. The Russian people know about Nazism. They know about fascism. Unfortunately, far too many of our people have forgotten it. So, are we back on the road that began in Munich in the 1920s? I don't know. Maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't, or maybe the world will end in thermonuclear war before we ever know the answer to that question. Now let's get back to the lines. Ian is in London, in Hounslow, uh, on No to NATO. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, hello, George. Yes, um, I know we've had Hi. this uh, No to NATO Garin sort of uh, put on ice due to external forces, but I have a suggestion. If the Royal Leonardo Hotel yeah. in Prescott Street, where Labour are having their regional conference, there's a nice pub across the road called the yeah. Princess of Prussia. We can go round and round with our placards, like a, a moving, a moving meeting, round and round. Because we're moving and we're on the public highway, they can't do nothing about it, technically. So if well, you I'll, your mojo, I'll, I'll tell you what, you up Ian, for it? Uh, you up for it? No, I've, <laughs> I've certainly not lost my mojo. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we're starting at 11 o'clock. Uh, we've got a venue. It is rock solid. Uh, no huffing and puffing from the, from the hyenas uh, will alter it. And we will announce it uh, the evening, I think, before uh, the event. So everyone that's got a ticket, head for central London on Saturday, the 25th of February, and be ready to be at a place in central London at 11 a.m. for the, the speakers platform, the mother of all speakers platforms, plus one or two surprises that we haven't announced yet. Thanks, Ian, for that. Now, look, the podcast news. The Moats podcast is now in the top 20 in Italy for all podcasts, not just politics podcasts, for the first time. How amazing is that? Thanks for downloading and listening. It's available every Monday afternoon. Here's some comments uh, from the poll on YouTube community. Uh, Ramming Speed says, yes, we will be at war with China, but by proxy. The British army is more like a defense force than an actual army capable of hitting a real superpower. And Rookie LFC says, no chance. We pick on weak nations that we have a chance of winning. 
the Taliban can kick out the US and NATO, what chance do we have against the Chinese? Well, Ruki, I'm only telling you what the American generals are saying and the American chairman of the Congress Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Lear Grace says, very weird question, who is we? Say, will the USA be at war with China? Stop acting as though the world is USA. Well, not really, Lear, because if the USA is at war, so will the UK. And if the USA and the UK are at war, so will the satrapies of the European continent. So I was right, and you are, I'm afraid, wrong. White knight black. Six years, not two years. We're not risking American troops, obviously. So Japan needs time to build up its forces. What a very shrewd observation. And Crowhawk says, as a former Tanzanian president, Julius Nairere, once said to a U.S. ambassador, USA is a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance, you have two of them. Ah, brilliant. Uh, look, uh, let's take a quick break, but right after the break, we've got a remarkable journalist and broadcaster, Mick Jones, who's an expat, independent journalist living in St. Petersburg in Russia. How fascinating is that? And he's got a big following too. Stay tuned, you'll find out why. Mick Jones played up front for Leeds United, of course. It's Mike Jones, the celebrated expat journalist in Russia, who joins us now. Mike, thanks uh, very much for uh, coming on the show. Tell us, uh, for starters, how you got to be living in St. Petersburg and doing so well as a journalist and broadcaster. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Mr. Galloway. It's an honour and a pleasure to be with you. Before I answer your question, I wasn't aware that uh, we had to bring our own hats. So, but don't worry, I came prepared. Uh, so uh, I ended up... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take it off. well done. I'll take it well off in just done. a moment, well don't worry. Done, man. Um, no, okay. I, I came to Russia after a job offer. Uh, I was in the gaming industry before, so I was on YouTube uh, prior. And uh, I came to work for the developer here in St. Petersburg. Within two weeks, I was snapped up by my wife. Uh, and this, as you remember, was the World Cup uh, back then, which I view now in retrospect as probably the height of relations, international relations with Russia. It was a wonderful time, uh, a huge celebration of the world coming together. Uh, and it was it was a beautiful time to be in Russia. And uh, I have absolutely no regrets. Um, and uh, yeah, here I am. Uh, and the reason I have this channel, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is the irony of the freedom of speech, democracy of the West, blocking Russian news channels. Yeah, uh, two weeks, that's pretty good going. My wife snapped me up in 20 minutes, uh, but uh, we'll not go uh, deeper into that. Uh, she, uh, the Russian, your Russian uh, missus, is the reason you stayed there. Everyone travels for love. But I'm sure by now you've fallen in love with Russia and its people because what's not to love? This place, this society, this, this great uh, storehouse of culture is a, an enormous uh, cultural power in the world of which this new generation is going to be entirely oblivious, aren't they? Absolutely. And uh, one of the reasons I even agreed to come to Russia was my distrust of the BBC portrayal of Russia. Uh, one would imagine the Soviet queue would, was still existing in this very dark uh, entity that the BBC would have you believe that Russia is. Quite the opposite. After probably 20 years of working in the UK my entire life, uh, I started out in the British Infantry and later on through civilian life, uh, trying to scrape together a deposit for a house. Uh, myself and my previous partner failed to do that. We rented all our lives. Uh, within two years in Russia, my wife and I had bought my first property, not hers. Uh, and for me, that spoke volumes about the opportunity, uh, certainly economically, for the working person in Russia. It's going on the culture. One of the first things that struck me was one of the first victory days was the March of the Immortal Regiment. With recent events, I think this is extremely pertinent with the memory of the people who have granted, or certainly Russia, and of course many of us in the West, granted us these freedoms that we enjoy today. That, criminally, I find the younger generation are not being educated to the same degree that the youngsters in Russia are. That gratitude for all the freedoms that they enjoy. 
Well, I saw a graph, uh, Mike, the other day uh, about French uh, people who were polled in 1945, they were polled in 55, 65, 75, and so on, uh, as to whom they attributed the victory over Nazism and the liberation uh, of their country and the continent uh, from uh, German fascism. Uh, and in 1945, as you might expect, something like 80% of the people uh, gave thanks primarily to Russia. Uh, but by 2015, uh, that number had fallen to around 12%, which shows that the eternal gratitude that King George, that Winston Churchill, that Avril Harriman, that uh, President Roosevelt and others promised the Russian people for their role in liberating Europe from Nazism it wasn't eternal at all in historical terms. It's, it's been five minutes and forgotten. Absolutely. Well, that promise held up about as well as uh, not one inch east, didn't it? Uh, that Gorbachev was assured. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Russia has unfortunately yes. suffered in of that. Of course, uh, yeah. And yeah, but uh, being a fool, of course, G Gorby uh, n didn't ask for it in writing on vellum uh, in copper plate uh, ink. But uh, let's not speak ill of the recently dead. Uh, now, you're in St. Petersburg. I know it as Leningrad, of course, and uh, visited it very many times in those days. It was always politically independent uh, somewhat, even in the decades of communist rule. There were always different political currents in St. Petersburg than in Moscow. Uh, do you detect any of that uh, today uh, in relation to the war in Ukraine? Is there, for example, more criticism, more opposition to President Putin in St. Petersburg as compared to Moscow? Initially, there were protests uh, in both Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, in St. Petersburg, there were reports. I didn't see them myself, but there was footage of people on the streets. Since then, I've not heard of any more. In fact, since my visits to Moscow, I've come across more Russians who are more West-leaning, more liberal, let's say, uh, than I have done in St. Petersburg. But you're right. St. Petersburg traditionally has been very much more European-leaning, uh, particularly in that regard, as you say, like with politics. But to date, uh, Putin has been handed numerous political gifts by the West. There's, you've touched on Annalena Burbock's words. Uh, we just talked about failed promises. Putin talking years prior about how the West couldn't be trusted. The Russian people have been shown through the West's own actions that Putin was absolutely right throughout, these, throughout all these years. And all these actions have just come to pass. Maria Zakharova's very poignant and emotional address on Friday. This was the first that I learned of um, this snub of uh, Russia in the Netherlands regarding Auschwitz and the liberation, where she detailed the... The, the trauma that the Russian people still feel, the hurt and the pain that they carry with them following the events of the Second World War. So that has solidified even further. It's almost like Putin could just sit back and let, let the West do the work for him. There's no talk of regime change here in Russia. I've never heard of a Russia saying, hey, we need to organize and get on the streets, just as I've heard Jimmy Dore doing. Now, I, I had to enjoy the irony. Yes, uh, and of course many regimes have changed in the course of the last few years. The number of people who said, you know, Assad must go, Putin must go, uh, Xi Jinping must go, the Ayatollahs must go, but it's usually them that say these things that go, uh, and oftentimes in uh, ignominy. The polling in Russia shows that Putin is far more popular than he was uh, before the war began, I wouldn't, if I were a Russian, have been voting for Putin uh, on domestic policies. Uh, I would have been voting for the leader of the opposition in Russia. Uh, though the foreign policy decisions that Putin has made on Syria and on Ukraine and so on, as you say, have been made very easy for him by Western perfidy or simple miscalculation. But it's obvious, or ought to be, that 
The Russians are not going to overthrow their government. They support it. That Putin doesn't have multiple cancers. He's not being replaced by a body double. He's not dead, as Zelensky said last week uh, he thought he was. He's in charge, and he's got Lavrov handling his foreign affairs, and in uh, Lavrov he has the most skilled uh, diplomatist in the world handling his foreign affairs. So every way you look at it, however you dice it, Mike, Russia is winning. They absolutely are. They are winning. They have won in many regards. And it's only for the West to admit it, but they don't seem to have any off-ramp, any de-escalation plans uh, that they can employ. And as you've said many times, they have said about to the last Ukrainian. And that's the huge tragedy. I've been three times to Donbass already. I, I've spoken to the people that live there. And that's where my, my heart genuinely bleeds for these people, because it is the ordinary people on the ground that are suffering for this power play between these two ideologies, these two forces. And it, to a degree, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which side of the border these, these people are. Uh, that's where my full sympathies lie. But as Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev, former prime minister and former president of Russia, has said, Russia cannot lose and Russia will not lose. And if you think you can defeat a nuclear power in conventional warfare on the ground, then unfortunately that's where Medvedev was warning about that ending in nuclear war. There, This is completely ill-advised. I'm reading the latest reports now today in The Sun about how the UK is con concerned about the Chobham, codenamed Dorchester Armour, on the Challenger 2s, if that falls into Russia's hands. The US, according to BulgarianMilitary.com, will not be supplying the M1 Abrams with their sort of patented secret armour as well, thus neutering any real defensive capabilities of the M1 Abrams. So all of this is... I thought sort of self-sabotage, really. It can't. I'm at the point where I don't believe it's stupidity. I believe it's almost intentional. Hence why Germany being goaded, forced, however you want to look at it, to this catastrophic decision against Russia, to my perspective and point of view, is to ensure that German-Russian relations remain irreparable for the next 80 years. Yes, uh, I think that's probably about the, the size of it. Now, you're a former military man, uh, I'm at a boy level, a cadet level, so was I. Uh, we both know, I think, that you could fit the entirety of the British Armed Forces into Villa Park uh, if they were unlucky enough to be forced to watch Aston Villa play. Uh, um, we will not be fighting Russia. Uh, it will be the United States that will have to fight Russia. What would be your message to the fathers and mothers of potential U.S. servicemen sent into a conventional war against Russia. What would your advice be? Goodness me, that's a, a terrible uh, specter to consider. Um, my, my advice to them would be, well, if it's your own son and daughter that's sent and fulfilling their oath to their country, then that's a very difficult thing to advise upon. Uh, my main thing for everyone on my channel has been, I remember the words of my grandfather, and uh, what he told me about his experience um, and how uh, I believe Russia is on the right side, certain right side of this, certainly ideologically. Um, I, I, would, I would only be able to extend my sincere sympathies and hope that uh, those people wake up. And again, similar to as Jimmy Dore has just said, you need to write to your representatives and try and exhaust all these instruments of democracy that you have. And if those fail, you need to get out on the streets to really demonstrate your disapproval and lack of consent for this bloodletting that I believe we're seeing. Who are your audience, uh, Mike, and how do people reach you? Because you're so impressive, I'm sure lots of people watching tonight will want to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, most of my audience uh, come from Western countries, a lot of them from Canada, uh, surprisingly, Australia, America, and of course the UK, among numerous other countries. My main platform is mainly YouTube. Like yourself, I have a Telegram channel as well where I share some of the updates that are not deemed suitable for our Western overlords on YouTube. Uh, and that is the, the main sort of channels that I use uh, to reach people. 
Well, you're too young to remember Mick Jones, uh, though your father might uh, remember him. He was quite a handful as uh, centre forward in a very tough Leeds United team. I remember him fondly because I kind of like that sort of thing. Mike Jones, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Thank and more you power so much. To so. your microphone. Let's go to Irlingborough. Irlingborough. I've never heard of that. I presume it's in English. It's from Chris Lee. Chris, where is Earthlingborough? <clears throat> yeah, good, uh, good evening, George. Great to hear you. Earthlingborough. Good evening. Well, I don't really know where it is. Uh, West Midlands, I guess. It's, um, it's, uh, it's about 80 miles northwest of London. Uh, it, okay. Um, it's an old Roman, no, it's it's an old Roman it's town. Uh, it used to be called... Um, really? Arnock it used to be called Arnockville or Arnock, and uh, anyway, I'm living here. But um, I, I do really, I'd like to say that I, I totally appreciate the fact that, that there's a voice of sanity. Why people like yourself are not actually in positions of power where they could change this nonsense, this continuing nonsense, and 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 whip us out of this this. <coughs> This entrenched insanity where, you know, long, a long time ago, uh, back 62, I'm an old guy now, I'm 73 now, but 62, I was about 11 or 12 at school, and it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and our school teacher didn't show, we had, a, we had, a, we had a, a, an alternate teacher, a young girl, and we're all sitting there, we're just sitting there in our class, little kids with our nice clothes on and our neatly combed hair with our pencils and rulers. And uh, she talked about, she was talking about the bomb and the bomb going off. And, and she, she talked about ground zero. And, I, and I, I asked her, miss, miss, what's ground zero? Oh, I, I said, she said, oh, that's where you want to be. I said, oh, why is that? I said, because when the bomb goes off, you'll just be vaporized and you won't feel anything and you'll be gone. And uh, I, was, I was so, <laughs> I was absolutely horrified by this. I couldn't believe that this was being told to me. And so I started a club called the Ground Zero Club. I made this badge with the Ground Zero and a line through it, no Ground Zero. And uh, there was about 12 or 15 members of the, of the Ground Zero Club. And now, now it's back again. The whole thing is, is back again, like some, like some repeating nightmare that you wake up, but you don't really wake up because it's still going on. I mean, man, can't we, can't we break out of this horrible nightmare? Well, I'm, I'm almost speechless, uh, Chris, at the sheer power of that call and the memories that it brings back. I, too, uh, recall though five years younger than you, uh, the feeling that the world was going to end that very night, that we would never wake up if we were lucky, and that we would be at ground zero if we were lucky, because then we wouldn't die a sickening death in a nuclear winter from nuclear radiation. We would die in the blast, in the fireball that would devastate the entire city. And now, like a recurring nightmare, it's back as you so eloquently, peerlessly put. God bless you, Chris, and thanks for that call. Uh, Farhan Fronchak is a journalist and radio host, but she's much more than that. She's a very good friend of mine, and she will be central to Moats America when we uh, can launch it. And in preparation for that, she has been digging away, mining the Twitter files, which most of us, let's face it, don't have the time to do. Some don't have the inclination. I have the inclination, but not the time. Farhan had both, and I'm glad she's joined us now to tell us about one or two of the nuggets that she has found there. Farhan, uh, welcome back, as always, to the mother of all talk shows. These Twitter files that uh, Matt Tybee and others uh, are writing up, uh, with the cooperation, of course, of, of uh, Elon Musk, the new owner of Twitter, Twitter, uh, who's opened the books, basically, though I'm sure not entirely all of them, at least yet. Uh, and what we are finding in these books is pretty horrifying, isn't it? You know, I would say that, George. I mean, but at 
at the same time, it's horrifying, but it's not something that we didn't think that we would see. Uh, you know, basically censorship coming from all angles, you know, from the Hunter Biden laptop story to even media having a hand in it to even all the way up into the upper echelons of the FBI. So it's nothing really uh, surprising that we're seeing. However, one thing that we are seeing here, uh, there's a group of creators and journalists here in the United States that are starting to actually see censorship again on Twitter under the direction of Elon Musk. Uh, it's the latest thing that's happening. Uh, you're having a number of creators that are being censored for frivolous reasons, especially uh, one of them in particular. Um, it is a, a an activist, a survivor activist of human trafficking um, who is going on the rampage on Twitter and banning anybody that uh, basically um, uh, it asks her questions about her life story. Uh, she goes by the name of Eliza Blue, and she is uh, she became prominent on the scene because of the Twitter files, uh, particularly when it came to uh, child sex trafficking or child porn that was found on Twitter. Um, you had a case uh, a few years ago of a John Doe, where it was a 13 year old, where his images were put online via Twitter. Uh, they uh, tried to appeal it to take it down, um, and. Uh, he was exploited and Twitter came back with the answer of we're not going to take it down. So she was very instrumental in helping uh, Elon Musk see a lot of that, especially in these Twitter spaces. But now you have a number of people that have been asking about her past, uh, particularly that she's appeared in music video, rap music videos and scantily outfits that she has. She goes by a number of different names from her past that she has. Um, as you could say in the United States, as we say here, like grifting for money for certain things. Um, so people called in a question on Twitter, you know, hey, what's this about? Could you clarify this? And she immediately went on the rampage. She's she obviously took it to Twitter. They've started banning accounts. They ban any any time you put up the music video that she happens to appear in. Uh, they they take it down. Uh, they either ban you. So this is a something that's starting. It's, it's starting small, George. But the fact that nobody in the mainstream media here in the United States is picking this up is honestly shocking uh, because you're having basically a meet the new boss, same as the old boss kind of situation going on with Twitter right now. Well, that's certainly true in my case, my, uh, my case against them in the Irish courts uh, is proceeding. Uh, it will reach uh, uh, a very important juncture in February, uh, just a few weeks from now, in mid-February, uh, I have to go and swear an affidavit and so on. And uh, we, we, we get no answers and certainly no action uh, from Twitter, though what their defense is going to be now is almost impossible to discern because Elon Musk has himself revealed the massive corruption uh, in the relationship between Twitter at the top before he arrived and the deep state in the United States and in other countries. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how they're going to defend my case. I, I might have to settle for a fleet of Teslas, not the Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. two that I was originally looking for. But um, the, the, the censorship has eased in some regards, uh, but has tightened in others and in still others. It's neither here nor there. So our friend Garland Nixon uh, is banned today, banned uh, tomorrow, back again the next day, back for another day, banned again. Ditto Scott Ritter uh, and many others. It's as if there's not a steady hand on the tiller. Perhaps when Musk's there, uh, things get better. When he turns his mind to his other businesses or his nine children, perhaps, uh, the, the cats away, the mice start to play again. What's your take on that? Well, that's just the thing, uh, George. And that's why I think the mainstream media really isn't touching it, especially the likes of like Fox News, who was like glorifying it. He was like the second coming of Jesus uh, for when he took over Twitter. And now you see that like nobody is touching this, this censorship issue. And it, it basically is, again, like that meet the new boss, same as the old boss situation, where if you happen to be close to the CEO, Oh, or close to the manager, uh, you're able to get certain things done uh, the way you see fit. If you know, and that's the one thing that a lot of people that are really free speech fighters here, um, including you know those that are very pro Julian Assange, which 
this activist actually, who's now going on and banning everybody, um, she actually showed up at Julian Assange rallies and was saying that she was pro free, pro free speech. And now it's turned around to where, oh wait, if I don't like something that you say about me, I can get you banned. Or if you put out a video about me, I can get you banned. And that's where a lot of these smaller creators, um, even some large ones too, that have 1.4 million followers, like a, a kid named The Quartering, um, banned because they reposted this stuff and people are asking and shaking their heads like wait a minute elon weren't you the beacon of free speech saying that how everybody had a voice in all of this and now the fact that somebody that's tied to you or that you have a close relationship with now they can go on the rampage and start banning people it doesn't make sense and that's where again so the likes of like a fox news or you know oan or you know uh the blaze or all these other republican outlets that should be picking up on this aren't even touching it because I think a lot of it is that they don't want to get Elon upset or they don't want to make anybody mad or it's kind of that, you know, oh, we don't want to get censored too. And so really what's the difference between Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk at this point? And a lot of people, a lot of, you know, haters will say like, oh, well, they, you know, they're going after Elon Musk. That's why, that's why this is all happening. Nobody want, you know, they want to, uh, you know, everybody's on the rampage to go against Elon Musk. Well, you said it was going to be totally different when you signed on. I get that sometimes writing code takes a bit of time and the algorithm, you know, he even said that he would probably have to blow up the algorithm because it was so inundated with all these restrictions. However, we're starting to see the same things again. And it's like, you know, and mind you, this story of, of this activist and her past, whatever it may be, they're hiding it the same way they did the Hunter Biden laptop story. And that's one of the things that this, this smaller, small group of both people on the right and the left are like, what's going on here? We need answers and we're not getting any. Fascinating. Uh, finally, Farhan, uh, speaking of that kind of thing, uh, amazingly, uh, maybe this only happens in America, it wouldn't happen here. Uh, the convicted child trafficker and abuser, Ghislaine Maxwell, gave an interview on British television. Well, internet television owned by Rupert Murdoch, Talk TV. Uh, I wasn't sure how she managed to do that and what the import of what she had to say was. Uh, my heart breaks uh, for her as a vegan in, the, uh, in the, <laughs> the difficult dietary situation in the pen. Uh, but it seemed like her main purpose was to give a free pass, a get-out-of-jail card, metaphorically, to Prince Andrew. What was your take on all that? You know, I think a lot of people here in the United States, um, you know, you have people that are either completely obsessed with the monarch, whether in regards to the whole Meghan Markle, Harry situation, but then um, looking at this this instance, like with Prince Andrew, as you say, and um, Ghislaine Maxwell saying that she wanted to do that. I mean, Americans are looking at this like, wait a minute. You know, there's so many Americans still here that have questions about Epstein Island. What was going on with that? Um, you know, but I think more of the biggest bombshell was is that Ghislaine Maxwell was basically saying that she thinks that Jeffrey Epstein was murdered. Uh, you know, you have a lot of Americans that still want to ask and have questions answered, but we're just not getting those answers. And I think Americans are at a point now where when we don't get answers from our government and it's just sit down, hush, hush, we're going to take it from here. Uh, you have a lot of Americans now that are just really fed up, to be frank. Uh, you know, you were talking to the one and only Jimmy Dore, Chicago's very own. I'm a Chicagoan myself. And, uh, you know, when you don't get these answers, that's when you have to take it to the streets. Uh, and that's where I think a lot of people, you, you know, we have this big anti-war rally coming up here in February, which I'll be at here in D.C. But I don't even think it's also anti-war. I think it's going to be anti-censorship, anti a bunch of other different things, because Americans just aren't getting answers. And we're being told to sit down and be quiet. And and again, the, the big oligarchs here. Uh, they say that there's Russian oligarchs. We got oligarchs right here too, baby. And uh, they're telling us that, you know, that they know better than we do. So just, you know, take it or leave it. And uh, Americans are just fed up, really. Well, uh, Jimmy was not so much on fire this evening as going <laughs> nuclear. And uh, he's uh, already raging against the war machine. And I'll be there in spirit with you uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. Thank you, Farhan. Amazing. Stay in touch. Keep mining those Twitter files for us because we'll need you. Uh, will we be at war with China in two years? 10,700 people have voted. 
and uh, most of you narrowly think uh, that we will not, but it's more or less 50-50, which is, I think, the best kind of polls. Let me take a 60-second break, and then it's your calls all the way to the wire. YouTube comments, uh, Tom McTeague, say their names, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Palestine, Somalia, Vietnam and Ukraine, American freedom in action. The clip that I did with uh, the fellow from Portland, Pipe Down Yankee, as it will come to be known, is uh, going like a train. Check it out if you haven't yet uh, seen it. Ian Foster says, and giant banderite-shaped insult to the memory of the millions of victims of the Nazis. Ian's referring to our Munich uh, video there about the Auschwitz affair. Tom in Islington says, fancy not knowing that the most famous Mick Jones ever was the Clash guitarist. As a matter of fact, I did, but being a man of my age and class, I preferred to think first of Mick Jones, the centre forward of Leeds United. Back to the lines, it's Patrick in Kidderminster on the no to NATO issue. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, George, thanks very much for allowing me to come onto the show. Um, a long admirer, admirer of you, and um, well, since you're MP of uh, Bow and, um, and Bethnal Green days, Thank you. and your fight for Thank your you. fight for getting the truth out there, you know, because um, I do hope that, unfortunately, I won't be able to attend the event, but I hope that it does go well for you and we do do something to stop the, this crazy, this craziness what's going on right now across, across Europe and, and what looks like could be kicking off in other parts of the world. You know, I've had my own battle truth out there myself, so much so that I've put together a website called thereisonlyonetruth.com and it talks about my own struggle in getting the truth out there and the challenges that I've met, you know. So that's www.thereisonlyonetruth.com and I invite people to go there and have a look and just see how difficult it can be when someone has a story or a message to tell in getting it out there, how it can be blocked, you know. So with that, George, I would like to say I wish you all the best for the... Um, for the upcoming event, and um, I hope that it does go Thank some you. way in, in the authorities making some reversal of what's going on now, because um, it's not just the people in the UK and Europe that's frightened. There's people around the world that I speak to, and I know that they're worried about what could escalate and, and be, you know, well, doomsday, really. Yeah. So yeah. with that, George, I'd like doomsday, to say all indeed. the best. Ground and, zero. Yes, absolutely. Ground zero. Absolutely, there's, George. There's the uh, poster there. There's the latest. Oh, look at these speakers. Craig Murray, the Right Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador. Honourable Peter Ford, former British ambassador. Fiona Edwards, a very bright young woman from No Cold War. Andy Hudd from the Aslev. Claire Daly, MEP. Mick Wallace, MEP. Anya Parimpil, American campaigner and journalist, former colleague of mine. Max Blumenthal of the Grey Zone, possibly the most forensic journalist working in America today. Loki, uh, the star. Uh, Audrey White, the pensioners champion on Merseyside. Myself, I haven't spoken in London for a long time. This will be my first time back. Chris Williamson, the former Labour Member of Parliament. Uh, Ruben Lawrence, who is a good uh, comrade of mine, a former soldier, former guardsman, uh, no less, and now a pillar of my party, the Workers' Party of Britain. David Miller, the academic. Dan Kovalik, the American writer and commentator and frequent guest on this show. And as I say, one or two surprise packets. So get a ticket. If you've got a ticket, keep it ready. Be in central London on Saturday the 25th of February and we hope that the meeting will agree to launch a new anti-war movement called No to War, No to NATO. Heaven knows our country needs one. Michael is in Minneapolis. Let's hear from him. We always get sense from him. Go ahead, Michael. Well, George, I'm, uh, I'm angry today. So I just want to quickly run through the timeline of the Tyree Nichols murder at the hands of the police and then talk about why it's so important and why this is such a, yeah. a huge and terrible event. I mean, the young man was taking pictures of the sunset in the park 
Then he leaves to go home to his mother, gets pulled over, and I've watched the video. It's beyond disturbing. The police immediately grab him, drag him to the ground, pepper spray him. They beat him with batons, kicks, and punches. They attempt to taser him. He escapes while he's calling out for his mother, which is his mother's house is just 100 yards away. They get him back into custody. They beat him more until he's totally unresponsive. And then they pick him up and lean him against the car. He slumps over again. The medics arrive, and they spend 16 minutes shooting the wind with the cops before they even do anything for this man. As he's laying, as he's sitting there, slumped over, dying. And, George, as you know, because we had many talks about this, in 2020, George Floyd was murdered in similarly outrageous fashion by the police. We protested in this country for six months straight. We got zero reforms. We got nothing from our elected politicians. And now here we are, almost three years later, going through the exact same thing again. And nothing has changed, George. Nothing has changed. And where are the American people supposed to go from here? Because no matter what we do, this keeps happening over and over. Last night, we tried to go out and protest in Minneapolis. The police overran us with dozens and dozens and dozens of squad cars until the protests. So we can't do that either. So I don't know, George, but I'm really riled up on this one. And this is just, I don't know how well, this is so sustainable. You be. It's not. Uh, so, so, so you should be. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, layers uh, to this. But let's deal with the obvious one, the, the elephant uh, in the corner of the room. Uh, these savages who beat this young man to death uh, were all, like him, black. What do we draw from that? That's what we draw from that, George. The only color that matters to them is blue, and they're only loyal to other to blue. And that's all that matters. We live in truly a police state. If even a black man can be murdered by a handful of other black men masquerading as police officers. And the way they talked about it after, George, they're joking about it. I mean, they're then they're coming up with their cover story. And I just think of the young man. He's saying they're saying, give me your hands as they have his hands pinned behind his back and they're beating him. They keep saying, give me your hands. They, they have him. They have his hands. They have him in custody. And it just doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, they were, saying that, they were saying that for the microphone on their vest, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. They're saying that exactly as if we didn't. But then, of course, there ended up being multiple videos, including, you know, thank God there was the camera from the, from the light post nearby, or we wouldn't be able to see in the detail from just the body cameras, um, which are kind of hard to, you know, to make out at times. And it's, you're exactly right, George. They're saying it for the cameras. And I'm just so upset about this. And there's you know, the fact that we elected an entire slate of Democratic politicians and they gave us nothing. And it was their base who was out in the streets protesting. We are, it was their Democratic base, young and multicultural and together, who marched for this. And we got nothing, nothing, no reforms, no changes. And now, the now uprising, another... Uh, yeah. The uprising over Floyd uh, began in your uh, state, in Minneapolis. Uh, how has Memphis... Uh, taken the final release of these videos? I mean, there have been, you know, there are immediate protests across Memphis. Um, and you can see them. I've been following them from, from afar. Obviously, Memphis is quite a ways from Minneapolis. Um, but, you know, the people can't believe it. And they're outraged across the board. And I've even seen, you know, I, it's, it's, we go through this every time, George. We go through this every time. I, I feel like you know, I feel like I'm banging my head against this wall because we've had this conversation before. And, we, you know, and it's just we a have. different day. And it's a different young man. And it's a different young man who lost his life. And that's the only thing that's changed and a different family that's grieving. And everything else is the same. People are outraged. People come out and protest. We demand changes and we don't get it. We don't get any changes. We don't get any reforms to the police. In fact, they get more. They got more money in their budget from from our current president got more, and the president before that and too. And, I'm not, and let's changed. not point fingers at him because it's, it's, it's every president, every, all the politicians back the sure. police without, you know, without any hesitation in all situations. And then they demand that we not, you know, and then we try to protest. They won't even let us do that. So I don't know. What they're an anymore, occupation George. force in uh, American cities, right? They, we are they're occupied in our own force. Yes. 
That's exactly. I mean, George, when we went out to last night and tried to protest, and the cops, you know, just overran us with so many squad cars that there was no chance of taking the street. I mean, they're sending the message that they aren't that these aren't our streets. You know. Powerful stuff. Thank you, Michael, in Minneapolis. Now, the switchboard has been rammed. Do you know how many calls we got last Wednesday? That's for the Wednesday night show, the quieter of the two. 157 people called the show last Wednesday, and it's been very busy tonight also. Kenson is in Bristol on Ukrainian refugees. Go ahead, Kenson. Hi. Hi. Good, good night, George. How are you? Hi. Yeah. Yeah, good. Right. Go ahead. At the time to be here. So, um, so besides um, my issue that I really um, called to talk about, yeah, I recently looked at a video on Channel 4 News where some Ukrainian ladies saying that here, yeah, um, this country is too diverse and they didn't know, they didn't warn her that here yeah, had different races of different people and different people groups and, and so forth. Yeah. So recently I had an experience. I saw it. I saw yeah. I, I, I've seen I've seen many, many such videos. They, all these countries that have taken them in, they're far too black, far too many Muslims and I don't know, refugees. Well, for I'm their really liking. Try, I'm, I'm Go really ahead. Trying to understand, I'm really trying to understand if you're in a country where there is war going on. So obviously people feel sympathy for you and bring you here and same way. Um, people from wherever else they came from, going to the same exact situation, you saying that you don't want to be bundled around these people because they have different ethnicities. I don't really understand what's really going on with these people, you know? It's just like, it's just like a fascist mentality they have that they, they, really, they really can't suppress their true nature, you know? So what are, my question is, yeah, my granddad, I'm a, I'm a black man, and my granddad fought in the war, right? He's from the Caribbean. He fought in the war against fascism and Hitler and whatever, right? So what I'm, what I'm saying is, what's really going on now in the world today? What's really going on? Is, is everyone going mad or something? I don't, I don't understand. What's really going well, there, on? Uh, yeah, there, well, there is a madness uh, abroad. Uh, we are led by dwarfish fools uh, who are out of their mind, literally, in the case of Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden is literally a blithering idiot. He makes George W. Bush look like Aristotle. Joe Biden is the dumbest man ever to hold office in any country, anywhere in the world. He reminds me of the late Hastings Banda, uh, who was the more or less dictator of, uh, uh, of uh, an African country I visited on a tour called Malawi. Uh, he, uh, when I came in, this would have been in the 1990s, uh, when I came in, he asked me, how was the prime minister, Mr. Wilson? I didn't have the heart to tell him that Mr. Wilson had ceased to be the prime minister in 1976 and had sadly passed away in the interim. Uh, Dr. Banda was by then uh, utterly senile, riddled with Alzheimer's and a blithering idiot who was being abused by being put up to meet politicians like me. When I look at uh, Joe Biden, I feel I'm looking at uh, the late Dr. Hastings Banda. I feel I'm looking at a literal idiot. And yet all these dwarfs that hold office in Europe, and it is odd, I know it's sizest, but it is odd that they are all physical as well as intellectual dwarfs, Macron, Rishi, Schultz, they are all little men with no back who have willingly gone in to the good night of being the vassals of an idiot, savant, president of the United States. Kenson, thanks for the call. I've got to get you off because still in Bristol, there's a legend on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, yeah, actually, that's two from Bristol tonight, but of course, the only woman again, me. <laughs> 
Anyway, what annoys me, George, is this free speech thing. If I wanted to get on a radio programme, phone in, and I was not pro-Ukrainian or pro-Nizensky, and if I talked about the census of the war, senselessness of the war, but I tried to mention facts about Russia not being all bad, we just get shouted down as if we're semi-traitors, you know, to the country. And it's so wrong because... We need this alternative. We can't have propaganda all the time without discussion. It's ignorant, isn't it, don't you think? I mean, it's a worry as well. Well, I do. It's a very great worry. Uh, What we have now is an information lockdown about the war. We have an information lockdown to willfully deprive the citizens who pay and may ultimately pay with their lives Uh, for the policy that is being pursued by our governments. The information lockdown is necessary because the case for the NATO side is so utterly flimsy and mad that only by denying to the public the existence of contrary arguments can they hope to continue to prevail. So... Every tool in the toolbox of censorship and repression, short of physical violence, so far, is being used. Uh, The shadow bannings, uh, the algorithmic suppression, the cancellations, and the the literal no platforming, deplatforming of of people. Uh, We've now uh, experienced that ourselves. Uh, But, of course, the show goes on, and this show uh, goes on, uh, Norma, and it's no show uh, without you. I'm glad that you uh, called and were our last caller, albeit briefly, and as you rightly point out, the only woman. I should say that uh, women callers are prioritised on here, so if you're a woman half thinking about calling, then please do. You will quickly find yourself on the air. So... We've come to the end of uh, the show. I promise you it would be a tumultuous one, and I think that it has been. Uh, Jimmy Dore, in particular, uh, was incendiary, as well he might be. And that incendiary performance illuminated darkness for many people about where we are in America, where America is and where we who are enthralled to America in the rest of the world are. The United States is a deeply sick society, a society that murdered its own president, that murdered its next president, his brother, a United States that murdered the Christian Tribune, Dr. Martin Luther King, a United States that murdered Uh, the effective president of black America, Malcolm X, a United States that drowned tens, scores of millions of people in blood around the world and yet still convinces itself as the fool in Portland on the hill on Wednesday's show made clear as being the people of the right people who are doing the right thing, people who are an exception. And it's true that America is an exception. It is exceptionally brutal. It is exceptionally corrupt. It has exceptionally foolish, in the case of Biden and Vino, in the case of the others, the Lindsey Grahams, the Nancy Pelosi's and the rest, It's exceptional, all right. It's exceptional in the number of people that its police officers kill. It's exceptional in the number of people that the citizens themselves kill. It's exceptional in that half of the country is poor or on low income in the richest country in the world. It's exceptional in that 70% of them still don't have health care insurance. It's exceptional. All right, in that it is effectively an apartheid, racially segregated 
society is exceptional in the fact that fools on that shining city on the hill have their finger on the trigger of weapons that could and may yet bring about the very end of humanity, the very end of the world. If that's a somber note to end on, it has to be. These are dark and dangerous times. You heard that wonderful call from the man who lived through being told it would be best to be sitting in ground zero when the bomb dropped because you would be instantly vaporized and you wouldn't feel it. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Note the different time. 9 p.m. UK time on Wednesday for the midweek mother of all talk shows. And get your ticket for No to NATO, No to War on February the 25th. See you then. <laughs>